31, <laughs> 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm is Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the just decrees of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. The epistle is from Hebrews 5, verses 1 through 10. For every high priest chosen from from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal greatly with the ignorant and wayward because he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. 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 That's close. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears, to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he, came, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The the gospel lesson for this fifth Sunday in Lent is found in St. Mark, the 10th chapter. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. 
But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. With all believers in the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church scattered throughout the world, we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge acknowledge one baptism baptism for the remission of sins, and and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pause for prayer. Good and gracious God, we are in a very holy and solemn time of year where we contemplate the holy mysteries of the cross and the sufferings of our blessed Savior. Draw us close to you during this time. Help us to contemplate and understand more deeply his sufferings, his death for our sakes. And as we do so, and as we are drawn closer to you, may we rise as Christ rose to live a new life for you, to be dedicated to you, to put things in order in our personal lives, to make you first, to put the kingdom of God in its rightful place. And help us, Lord, to be the lights that you've called us to be in this very dark and dangerous world where people are falling away from you left and right. And they need correction and they need your holy word more than ever before. So feed us today and strengthen us for the days ahead and for our callings under the cross. Amen. During our Sunday morning Bible class, we've been going through the book of Genesis. And the Old Testament is really important in order to understand the New Testament. If you really don't have an understanding or a grasp of the Old Testament, you really can't understand the New Testament well. At least that's what I think. And in the Old Testament, we get a really good understanding of the concept of covenant. Covenant is not just a handshake and a grin between a customer and a used car dealer. It's much more than that. And in Genesis chapter 15, God gave Abraham a solemn promise. He told Abraham that you're going to be the father of a great nation. And this nation is going to bless all the other nations of the world. And Abraham just couldn't see it. Um, he'd been through so many things, and he was so old. How could he have a son, and how could this blessing ever happen? And so God wanted to show Abraham the seriousness of this covenant. And so he told Abraham, go get a ram, a heifer, some goats, and some birds. You're going to sacrifice them. You're going to cut them apart into two pieces. And you're going to make kind of an aisle, like we see here, between one part of the sacrifice and the other part of the sacrifice. And then Abraham went into a deep sleep, and God's presence went between the cut-up pieces of sacrifice. And it's what we call a cutting sacrifice. And God was trying to show Abraham how very serious he really was in making this promise and covenant with him. And as we see in the ancient Middle East, as you read through history books, as we see in the Bible, men used to make cutting covenants with one another. You read, for instance, in the Bible where two nations came together and they wanted to make agreements about land usage, they'd make a cutting covenant. They'd cut animals and they'd walk through the midst of these cut up sacrificial animals. And the statement that they made was, we're serious about this. This isn't just a handshake and a wink. This is serious business. And whoever breaks this covenant, they're going to be just like those animals that have been slaughtered and cut in two. And God, later on in history, made a very important covenant with the nation of Israel. After he had, he had kept his promise with Abraham and the nation of Israel did emerge as a strong nation in the Middle East, God made a cutting covenant with this nation. And so we want to talk about that Old Covenant and then the New Covenant that God made. So we know how that all transpired, but just as a review, God 
rescued Israel after 400 years of bondage in Egypt. And the, the imagery is that he reached down his hand and took the hand of Israel and guided them out through the Red Sea into the wilderness. And after several months, they came to a mountain that we know as Sinai. And there at Sinai, God made his formal cutting covenant with the nation of Israel. There was smoke that came out of the mountain. There was the sound of a trumpet. God's voice was heard. There was lightning. There was thunder. And the people of Israel came to Moses and said, we don't want to hear God's voice anymore. It scares the daylights out of us. And the, the nation of Israel was just melting in fear and they were trembling in their boots as they stood at the base of Mount Sinai and saw all of this going on. All of God's seriousness and God's power and might. And so they said, you talk to God for us and we'll listen to you. And so that's exactly what happened. And Moses went up on the mountain and we know that he came down with the law of God. And this was the basis for God's old covenant, his old cutting covenant with the nation of Israel. And it had a threefold aspect to it, the moral law, which is God's immutable will, which is in, in effect today. God will never set aside his moral law. You shall have no other gods. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. That's a part of God's moral law, which unfortunately today our nation in mass is departing from. We see evidence in that. Just turn on your TV set. Look at a movie that's out there today. Listen to the language that most people speak today. In mass, our country is turning away from God's immutable will and his moral law, and it's a serious matter. Judgment, if we don't turn around, judgment is around the corner, I believe. But anyway, I, dig I, I digress. There was the... the um, ceremonial law and there were the civil laws that was the basis for the covenant that Israel made the cutting covenant with God and so it was made at the base of Mount Sinai Moses wrote it down and we have it recorded in the Pentateuch the first five books of the Old Testament and Furthermore, after they came into the land of, of Canaan, they went into a valley, and on one side, the laws were, were um, read, and on the other side, the nation of Israel that heard the law of God read, they said, Amen, and they bound themselves to this covenant. The problem was, that Israel found out real soon. It's not that easy to stay in covenant relationship with God. Because of our sinful nature, it's just all too easy to deviate from the moral law of God and because of our fallen nature also, not to keep, especially in those days, all the many hundreds of rules and regulations that were involved in the civil and the ceremonial laws. And there was a part of the ceremonial law that God had encoded that allowed for remission of sins. And that was the cutting up of animals. So that was a part of God's cutting covenant. And especially we see it in full force in the temple in Jerusalem where day in and day out animals were taken doves and lamb and goats and heifers, cattle were taken to the altar in the temple at Jerusalem. They were sacrificed. They were burnt. 
So every day, people who had committed sins or infractions would bring these animals, and through the priesthood, their sins would be forgiven, or at least they would have the acknowledgement that their sins were forgiven. And then there was the great day of atonement, Yom Kippur. And the Jewish people still follow that today. And on the day of the atonement, the high priest would be sanctified. He would go through many ritual washings. And then he would go through the curtain in the temple, 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, 4 inches thick. He'd go through the veil in the temple with the blood of sacrificial animals. And he would sprinkle the blood, especially on the uh, Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. And all the sins of the people that they had committed that whole entire year, sins of Israel, were covered through the animal blood. But many of the people of Israel at that time were under a cumbersome, burdensome system. And they didn't have direct access to God. They had to always go through a priest or an intermediary in order to know that they had forgiveness of sins. They couldn't come directly to God. There was always that priest, always that person in between who they had to depend on to know that they were forgiven. Forgiven. And Israel, especially through Yom Kippur and the sacrificial system, was dealt with as a whole rather than an individual. They didn't have, as we have access to God today, a personal relationship with the Lord. And that's what they, that what they were yearning for. And in Jeremiah chapter 31 that was just read today, Verse 33, God spoke some remarkable words to Jeremiah, and I'm sure he was scratching his head when he had these words revealed to him. God said, this is the covenant that I will make between me and Israel. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. A cutting covenant. A new covenant. And the words in Hebrew are very interesting. Haberit asher ekrot. It's translated into English as the covenant which I will make. But if you look at that word in the Hebrew, ekrot, it's a um, perfect um, first person singular for you grammarians out there and it means I will cut I will cut a new covenant with my people the cutting covenant and we see the fulfillment of that cutting covenant when the Lamb of God who is destined before the foundations of the world to be the Lamb of God he went to Calvary's cross, and at Calvary's cross, he was cut. He was pierced. He was pierced in his hands and feet and pierced with a sword on his side. He became the epitome of the cutting covenant. And through that cutting or piercing, the new cutting covenant was established. And now... No more sacrifices. No more priests who come between us and God. No more ceremonial laws are necessary. No ornate rituals are necessary. No animal sacrifices necessary. Now in this new covenant, we hear a very special message very beautiful message that Christ Jesus, the Lamb of God, was sacrificed in our place. 
He went behind the veil with his own blood and that own blood sacrifice that he made was accepted by God Almighty, by Yahweh, the God of the universe. And now when we hear that gospel message, it creates faith in our hearts. And the faith that we have that's created by the Holy Spirit through the gospel accepts all of God's promises. And all of God's promises in us are yea and amen. And when we accept God's promises, we receive the Holy Spirit and we are enabled to do God's will. And we become God's priests. So we don't have priests that are necessary that we have to come to God through. We are the royal priesthood. That's what Martin Luther discovered 500 years ago, rediscovered in the Reformation. We are a priesthood of believers. God dwells in us. We are God's temple, and it is a very glorious and wonderful thing. This is what the Old Testament believers were yearning for, and it all happened on one of the most important days in history that we know as today, Good Friday, which is a little over a week, a little less than two weeks away. And so today our hearts are warmed when we hear the gospel and we love to hear the gospel and we're instructed in the gospel personally when we just open up our Bible and read it and meditate on it and we are instructed in the gospel and the whole Word of God by called pastors and teachers of the word and as God's royal priesthood we're equipped through word and sacrament. And so today we have the opportunity to go, in a sense, behind the veil into God's throne room and receive the very body that was cut and bruised and broken for our sins and the very blood that was shed for us that was the establishment of the new covenant and we receive that into our own spirits and souls. It is the very body and blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, and it strengthens us and refreshes us so that we may be that royal priesthood that God has given to us. And every Sunday, every day for that matter, we can come before God and we can confess our sins and know that those sins are forgiven through the blood of Jesus. And we can come here as a corporate body on Sunday mornings and confess our sins and receive holy absolution. As I speak the words of forgiveness, those are God's words, not my words. And so we have joy and delight today in this new covenant. We have this personal relationship with God. We have God actually dwelling within us because of what Christ did on Good Friday. But I just want to remind you that God takes that covenant very seriously. He took his covenant with the Old Testament people very seriously. And when they were breaking his covenant, he sent his prophets to, the, to Israel and warned them of the seriousness of breaching the covenant with him. God said that he was their spouse and that as Israel departed from the covenant, they were, they were committing spiritual adultery. And we know how serious God got with the nation of Israel when they breached the covenant with God. For 70 years, they were expelled from the Holy Land, from Israel. Their temple was trampled down and destroyed, and they became slaves in Babylon. God wants us to take his new covenant seriously, not to despise preaching and his word, not to neglect the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some not to live reckless and immoral lives. Because the same thing that happened to Israel may happen to us as we depart and breach that holy covenant. May we keep it. May we honor it. May we respect it every day of our lives. And as we do, 
God dwells in us. We are his people. And we are empowered and we are equipped to go out and to preach the excellencies of our Lord, our covenant God, to those who are living in darkness. And we have the power through our word and through our witness and testimony to invite them in to the light. And may we do that, and may we um, invite many in so that they may be part of the same holy covenant that brings joy and delight into our hearts that we have. Amen. In the peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus.